mean back to the very beginning? Back to the very, very beginning. Good place to start. It is a very good place to start. <laughs> um, uh, well, VR is well. It's tricky because mm. let me let me tell you this. Um, the conversation has deviated between VR and 360. Mm -hmm. VR is a bit more. You know, we joke around. We say it's a difference between a movie and a film, mm -hmm. right? VR is a bit more complex. Yep. Right. Um, there's a bit more interaction. Um, in VR, and, I, and I'll get to the, your question in mm -hmm. VR there's things like positional audio mm -hmm. or focus gazes where you can click, you know, tap the thing and go mm -hmm. somewhere. Or, so in 360 it's purely because 360 is predominantly on YouTube and Facebook, mm -hmm. it's simply what you see is what you get. You mm -hmm. can't really interact right. with I don't, you know, so, so we do both. We like true VR very much. And true VR extends into volumetrics, mm -hmm. like photogrammetry, videogrammetry, where you can move around real spaces in the Vive, and you've got grids of where your movements, you know, so that's real, that's like deep VR, mm -hmm. you know? So how to do VR, well, you have to think of like, you know, if you're talking about, because it's such a good medium, you can use it for all sorts of things, but in a narrative sense, which mm -hmm. is what I can speak to, you, you do it like theater, yep. you do it like a play, and you do masters, one big master at a time, mm -hmm. and you hope an actor doesn't drop a line. You know, because if you drop a line, you got to go back and start from the top and mm -hmm. shoot the master again, until you have some sort of exceptions. Like in horror, mm -hmm. why we like horror, yeah, or why most people think horror is well suited to VR, is because in horror you can things can malfunction, mm -hmm. and in that malfunction you can hide a cut mm -hmm. and then sub for a different take. Mm -hmm. See, there's a little bit of that. As long as your your movement is blocked fairly well, mm -hmm. you can use the excuses of horror to to mask your cuts. Mm -hmm. So that's why people like the genre. Um, but for the most part, you do it like theater. Rehearse, 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 then block around the camera. Then I leave the room, and I hope that my wireless monitor doesn't fizz out, and the actors go. And if they drop a line, we go again. And if they go four-fifths of the way through and they drop a line, we go again. But then, that's the standard. But then it gets into like, you know, eye for an eye, which I'll send you as a follow-up. You'll be able to watch it on YouTube, um, or Viridia, whatever the case may be. Um, iPhone I has ghosts and candles going on. It's a seance. So all of those post-production um, elements have to be taken into account, to get into account. So you shoot like blank plates and then you shoot like Easter egg, like, a, like Easter eggs of just the candle and then stitch that into the blank plate, into the immersion space. So that gets a bit complicated. But for the most part, it's like theater. Well, the less cameras you have, the less stitching there is to do. The line doesn't do. So if you do with 17, there's an awful lot of stitching. We shot Eye for an Eye with four GoPros, which is something that we, you know, we did it in collaboration with Weaver. So Weaver provided their patented rig. And so they're, you know, so now we have a camera, an action camera 360 that's two. As long as the lenses have a wide enough sphere, mm -hmm. you know, um, they, as long as they overlap in a Z, like a Venn diagram, you know, then the stitch happens in the overlap. You know, they stitch each, they, you face each other out of the open, so it's just one stitch line. But as long as their spheres are enough where they're overlapping on the capturing of footage, it works. So with the two one, it's just two, I think it's 290 or 230, I'm not sure. But obviously 230 is each is more than 180. So they overlap. So then you're able to capture it all. You know, there used to be things on your camera, on your cell phone, where you could just move around and mm -hmm. do a 360 photograph, you know? So it's kind of like that, as long as you're not losing anything in the, in the sphere. As long as the lenses aren't wide enough, as mm -hmm. long as you don't lose anything, you got it. But um, that's why it started with a GoPro fro. It started with like 17 of them because the, because the, the sphere wasn't wide enough. And then they figured out four GoPros and two, then Kodak came up with the two, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know, the, the thing about the Kodak and the Samsung, what we're learning, is that they're action, they're action cameras. So they don't respond well to low light. They want to be outside. They want to be in a, in a very well lit space or outside. They don't want to be, it's not like they can do moody lighting. They don't respond well to, to that. Slowly but surely, you have to figure it out. Well, look, when I, when I, when I, the, the Kodak I keep in house is to make social media. When we do real VR, we go rent, mm -hmm. uh, like a, the VR camera that suits us the, the most. Uh, things that are really shooting in 4K, and, um, you know, th like something like the Ozu is like the high end, you know, it, it does, it, it tracks your audio in the space as well, like, which makes your sound designer's job much easier. So there's a lot of, you know, the cameras are in, in layers of, of complexity and ability. So you just choose the, the right horse for the right course, I think. You know, a big budget VR piece shouldn't use a Kodak. You should go rent an Ozu, you know. Just and like, you know, if I was shooting with a 5D or with an Alexa, it's different. Mm -hmm. Being addressed directly. 
uh, floating in that gray area between proactivity and reactivity. It's interesting. Um, also, the sound design in your ear. Audio is cool. To have audio position on your ear is cool, right? Because it really that's something. Because that, oh, sound design has always been a big thing of horror, always. So the fact to have it positional now is really sweet, um, and that's deep. That's more true VR. But but that's a big thing. And then to be able to guide your focus is really great. But also to be included, to be addressed directly, the fourth wall be broken, is really neat. And again, the 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 the, the forgiveness it grants you with being able to make edits and to be able to make like crazy lighting or having the lighting change as the scene goes on and address like the content of how it's progressing you know like having the lights getting darker or getting redder or you know things like that that you'd be like this is a rom-com why is it all that you know like things where horror allows that is fun it's a lot of fun but a lot of it comes with the writing i think it starts in the writing phase i think even if other people write me vr i think people you know one thing we're really proud of for eye for an eye is that um, we, like when I was approached to pitch it to, to, you know, I was approached by Weaver to pitch some creative. Um, and that kind of got me the bunk. Everything that happened after that was, was a happenstance of being in the right place at the right time and necessity being the mother of invention. A producer partner of mine at the time brought me into the room with the creative director of Weaver who said, you know, we'd like to try this, pitch us something. I could have, could have or could have not gotten the pitch. But I went back and, and thought, well, if I was doing this for any other thing, what would I do? So I wrote something to be read and experienced before we shoot a frame. I feel like that's what a screenplay should do in some capacity. So I figured, well, what's that? How does that look like writing for 360? You know, writing, a, writing dialogue for 360, you know, like, what does that look like so that people can read before they put any money in? I said, okay. So I went and I figured out how to color code it so that you know where you're looking at any time. And I gave like quadrant one, I, I, I like sextets because up and down, not just one, two, mm -hmm. three, four, but yep. five and six. So I said like, sextet one is red, sextet two is blue, sextet three is green, sextet four is yellow, sextet five is purple, sextet six is um, uh, brown, and then everything in, in bright pink is a focus gaze, like where you could jump across the room. And I wrote it and coded the script that way, so that as they read it, they know what, what, where they're supposed to be looking for this particular line or for this particular piece of action. So on the page, they, they got it, you know, they saw it. And I feel like that helps you immensely when you're directing. The screenplay still helps you a lot, and it shouldn't be forgotten. It all starts with a, with a great script, even if that script greatness now is predicated on the way it's coded for 360. I'm excited about, to, to keep it simple, choreographing body movement, and I'm not talking about volumetrics, I'm talking about mobile VR. But choreographing body movement through and through the through the immersion and the emotional investment of the user in the piece to satisfy an end goal. Let me be clearer for you. I'm doing content for children's hospitals for children during blood tests that get them done frequently, chronic like chronic illnesses or frequent blood tests that are done. To be so so, what I'm thinking of is the child to detach them from anxiety during the blood test because they have to do it often, but also the nurse. So what I'm thinking of, in, in what's cool about VR is that, okay, so I could put Kung Fu Panda 3 on there. And I get all these bright ideas from the great futurists. I work with an amazing futurist, an experienced designer, like a UX person who's just brilliant. She's a woman, obviously. Um, so, uh, so we, we were talking humanly about what's a blood test like, what's a blood test like, and I, you know, the people that were pitching me creative on this said, well, I, you know, there was always this element of sit still, especially if you're four to eight years old, sit still, right? Okay, sit still, okay. And then there's, the, wouldn't it be amazing if voluntarily the child would extend their arm rather than have the nurse have to pop it down and do it? That within what they were watching motivated them to sort of go through the choreography of a blood test and the, the, the throws of that blood test. So, what can I do in my VR experience? What can I reward them with in distraction that encourage them to sit still? That the magic won't continue unless you sit absolutely still. And everybody else in that space is sitting still. But they're all waiting for you to sit still so that we can go on to the next piece of amazingness. So then the kid, sit still, you know? Okay, then now that makes the nurse like Because now nurses can get through more kids. They can see more people, right? So. It's, I'm trying to, I'm, I like solving the, I like the neuroscience 
I love catharsis, I love story, but I love the way neuroscience can come now in this medium and like fill in a layer for us that's super cool. You know, like to sit still and extend your arm, like what nurse has ever seen a kid come into it, come into, you know, because they're wearing the Google Cardboards, you know, sit still and extend their arm, that'd be amazing. And then, when they take their goggles off and they look down at their Band-Aid, the Band-Aid will be branded like the Band-Aid in the content, which has been awarded as a, as a Medal of Honor. All the other people in that content are wearing that band-aid. And now she's got hers. So when she takes the goggles off and looks down, she sees it and she thinks, oh, cool. You know what I mean? Now we have this transmedia relationship, which is like really special. And we're going places where film can't really go. And then what you can do is you can grow the world, right? You can start to keep telling that story, you get them attached to the characters, and, you know, because it makes life easier for everyone. That's you know? It's nice to keep the nurses in mind. You know, the kids are gonna have a blast. You can put Kung Fu Panda for them that have a blast. But to do something that helps the nurses out, wow, that would be really, what a twofold bonus of footage. Where the, when it comes to empathy versus delight, filmatics is firmly rooted in delight. I like delight. And with delight, I think there's a strong essence of wish fulfillment. I think for me to green light projects or pursue them, there's an enormous amount of wish fulfillment. And the thing of wish fulfillment is that it has this tried and true trait for all good stories, is that wish fulfillment is incredibly simple, right? So, when I was tasked by Weaver to come up with things, my wish fulfillment in VR, if I was 13 in a bedroom after school, or 48 coming home from work or whatever, or into that kind of thing, I'd love to go to a seance. That's very simple wish fulfillment. So for me, what's on the ticket, what's on the poster, keep going towards what's the wish fulfillment of the content, you know what I mean? Like, we want to do a piece of content in Volumetrics where you're a VIP, you've got a bodyguard, and you end up in a very precarious situation. All hell's broken loose and you got to get out of this room. It's an amazing action sequence in Volumetrics, but all you have to do is follow the bodyguard out of the room. And there's things whirling around you, people coming at you, that's a really simple idea. It's just wish fulfillment. I've always wanted to do that. I've always wanted to step into an action scene of a movie. It can get simpler than that. So I think as long as you keep it simple, simple, simple. Like for the kids, you know, to, to fall into a magic place where they don't where they don't feel as alien from their blood test as they might. Simple, easy peasy. So for me, that's what I think. I think you got to stay to the. Just be, just stay simple. Just stay poetic about it. You know, I think ivory tower VR or things that are hard to pitch scare me. You know, because the the medium is already complicated, especially in these early days. You know, it's. I mean, look at look at like God, like like look at Baobab. Baobab Studios are the anime. They're, they're, they're the strong arm in animation in VR. They were on our panel yesterday. They did this wonderful thing. I can distill it to you in. It's a piece of animation. I can distill it to you in one sentence: Rabbit versus Alien. It's called Invasion. That's all I need to know. Not empathy is not always like that. Empathy is difficult to pitch. You know, clouds over Syria, or whatever they have. I mean, that's not. I don't get what that. I don't get what I'm signing up for. With empathy, it's difficult. But with delight, you take the old model of like, what's on the ticket? What am I? What am I gonna do? There's five VR movies playing in my headset this Friday that just came out. What do I want to see? What's the easy sell? You know, I like show business. It is exciting. It's exciting as a creative too. This is a creative. It's solving these, continuing to solve these problems for this medium to tell a story. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I see it as a new. I see it as a as a creative challenge. Um, because I'm a modernist at heart. I like form and content being well connected. You know, I think the form should really talk to the content that deserves to be in that form. So I'm always um, auditioning content on that level, and that's exciting for me. I like that. You know, even my films, my features and videos are all about the cap. They're all about the conversation. So I don't know. For me, it's, that's important. But I'm, I think what you're talking about versus regarding Hololens, you're gonna, you're thinking more about a little bit about augmented reality, which is like. What you would call it. Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go. Everyone now knows what augmented reality is. It changed the world in a day. Um, and you're thinking about something like the HoloLens, which is where holograms come in, and that's Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, it's not quite what it's not quite us. Mm -hmm. You being able to sit with your mom, with you being in China and your mom being in Texas, that's HoloLens. You know, and that's more like the HoloDeck. Good question. Uh, I believe it's successful when it does the same thing that normal movies do for me in terms of the, the catharsis and the arc and the, the journey, but also when it does this, when it adds that extra layer of feeling, like, like you said, I really disappeared. Like I really disengaged for a while. You know, I was outside my head for a while. Um, and then I think it's really successful. And that's, funnily enough, increasingly more difficult for me 
because I like here's what I think I think with immersion and VR and 360 this sort of trait of pay no attention to the man behind the curtain it's really strong because having done it it's very hard to get me to disappear I see all the strings I see the stitch lines I see how it was done why not so much with film with film I can still vanish even though I make film but with VR it's harder for me and I think there you have you, you have to get ready a little bit this may be a bit controversial but you have to get ready if you're gonna make real VR you have to get ready to sell your soul because you'll never see VR that way again so you have to make that deal with yourself that you're giving up that experience because the minute I step into it I see it I see the coding I see the CGI I see I see what the pro I see programmers at their desks typing I don't see the content so successful VR content for me is when the, all of that goes away and it really lives like for example I saw a simulation of um, and this particularly just for me you know because I know how it works but like for me I saw a simulation on YouTube of Harry the Hedgehog you know this one in the vibe where they, he can't get a hug in the balloons have you done it mm -hmm. yeah this one for me blew my mind like this is <laughs> even though I know I know how it goes and whatever but the story is so great and so perfect that like that's successful VR for me. well the hardware will get smaller you disappear into your face via contact lens or whatever it is. Uh, volumetrics will get exciting. I want to see them be able to tell real stories in volumetrics. I think Harry's on the way, but I think, like, e even in, in videogrammetry, like with real people in volumetrics and the vibe and telling those stories will be really interesting. Not just an experience, but a catharsis would be really interesting um, to get to. Uh, and for me, I think, and, and I'd like to see the tipping point. I'd like to see more wine and not so many bottles. You know, that would be, that's, I think, I think those are the three, the hardware, there's too many bottles and not enough wine right now, so pro crossing over to wine, which will inherently cross us over to a tipping point where VR will become a commonplace appliance in your home, you know. It will anyway, because of the practical use, the training, and the therapy, and the, uh, the practical appliance of it. Um, but, you know, AR is going to be, AR is going to be like having a toaster. That's for sure. Because you'll buy a piece of IKEA and you'll put your glasses on and the IKEA will assemble in front of you and you can, will just be able to follow it in AR, right? Done. I mean, that's really simple how it's going to be used. It's going to change our life. So I feel like when VR starts to have that appliance, like that, that, um, how am I saying? That feeling of being an appliance in the house, being very, very like your cell phone is, like it's an extension of you, that's the next 10 years for VR.